if you haven't shared the live you better share the live right now if you're just joining us you're locked in to Kako T. We're streamed by Digicel in the entire Caribbean. Over 30 countries are actually plugged into this show right about now, as well as in Dominica um, on G Digicel Channel 3, as well as on Digicel's Facebook page. So big up yourselves one time. Thank you very much for joining us. If you guys want to communicate or share in the conversation, the only place, unfortunately, to do it, because you see, I'm a one man kind of show. I'm my producer. I am tech technical technician i'm host i'm everything in one right the only place you can actually come is on my page that is J L I E S. that is the only place that you can really communicate so if you want to share with uh, share um comments and and, and and have anything to say that's the only place you can actually do it during the course of the show and i can give you a little acknowledgement all right guys okay renee francis is joining us in just a few seconds and i just want to let you guys know a little bit about um renee um renee is family so so she 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 gets like the the family status she gets special treatment sorry she gets special treatment but she's not just a family and and one of the things that i i want i i think it's probably a family thing for us to have so much drive and want to do so much but this girl holds a, a bachelor's degree in forensic science a master's degree in criminal justice right she has been with the nypd that is in new york city for 10 years and she's actually been a supervisor for five of that those years and listen to this renee francis is currently a lieutenant in the detective bureau more specifically the 46th precinct which is the most violent precinct in Bronx area in New York. She supervised 24 detectives and two sergeants. And guess what? She from Dominica. Oh gosh. Oh gosh. Guys. Whew. I almost want to cry. <laughs> like I'm getting super emotional, but Make some noise, share some love to my girl who's joining us right now on Kako T. Hi, Renee. Hi, JL. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I was just watching your show and everyone was texting me in anticipation like, did I miss you? Are you coming on now? I'm like, I'm coming. Have some patience. <laughs> so thanks for having me. I'm like, this is surreal i've never done something like this so i'm very appreciative of you choosing me to be on your podcast so thanks i mean it, it, i would not there would there be no other way than to end this show with <laughs> with you with, you are the only person that could wrap up season three let's just put it that <laughs> you're the only person uh, along with Dane that could wrap up season three and the love is coming your people are messaging like crazy. <laughs> and i want to encourage you don't be distracted by them eh? because they just yeah. conversations with each other and answering questions and all of that stuff keep your eyes on me and we're gonna have a <laughs> we're gonna have a good time people i hope you guys have shared the live if you haven't now is the time to do so um first of all i want to tell you how proud i am of you you know um as a woman, as a black woman, family, you know? I know, I know. it's crazy. I'm, I'm so proud of you. And, and, and what do you do? You have a show. I'm just, I'm just a lieutenant. I'm not doing podcasts. I'm not doing none of this stuff. I'm just trying to, you know. It's the jeans, man, you know? We got some good dress pants. Not jeans. Good dress. <laughs> <laughs> I want to start. First of all, who is Renee? Who is Renee? Wow. Um... Honestly, just a girl from Sufrien, Dominica, that decided to go to New York and um, further her studies. And that's where I thought it would end. And then um, I ended up joining the department and having a love for helping people, in, especially in New York. There's so much diversity here, so you can help a, a wide range of people. And I loved it from day one, and then I just stuck with it and moved up the ranks. So just a small island girl living in a big city. <laughs> And just doing doing what I was taught, helping people and, and, you know, keeping to a very strict moral code and, you know, hanging out, doing my thing, being very thankful. So, 
you were born in Dominica. You were born in Sufriere. Um, Sufriere, help yourself. <laughs> you, you're from Super. What was life like for you as a child? Oh, man. So some of my fondest memories in Sufriere is just, the, what I love about that village is that everyone is so close-knit um, and they look out for you. But um, like I was part of the uh, altar serving community in the Catholic church there. We have the oldest Catholic church there, the building. And I just remember everyone honestly treating me like I was part of their family. Obviously, I had my own family, my mom, my aunts, my sister, my cousins, um, who obviously raised me. But I feel like we were raised by a village. Everyone obviously embraced me. And I, you know, we live right by the sea. And I just loved going there and just hanging out by the bay. And everyone was, I never had a, a bad experience in that village. I never did. And I, and I miss it. That's why I try to go back home at least once a year, because I just feel... Sometimes you just feel like a fish out of water when you stay here too long. You know, you have to go back and go back to your roots. So kind of like recharging the battery. So, yeah. You left um, Monica, um to pursue your study. Mm -hmm. What made you decide, first of all, to leave? And what? why did you choose that path in terms of your studies? So honestly, a lot of the credit goes to my mom. She passed away five years ago. Um, uh, so my mom and my aunts, I always saw, and my cousins as well, I always saw how big education played a role in their success. So I was kind of envious about that. I felt like they were, you know, they, they were raised by a strong woman, my, my, uh, my grandmother and her and their dad. And it, they always instilled in them that without education, you, you know, you kind of like, you, you don't really have, you have a compass, but you don't know where you're going. So my mother always told me, you know, your, your brain is a muscle and you have to exercise it through education and learning. And there's such a big world out there. I remember my aunt, I never forgot this. I don't know if I ever told her, but um, my aunt had went up for Carnival Queen in Dominica in 1986 and she won. And the only reason she did that was to get a scholarship because at the time we didn't have a lot of money. And the only reason she did that was to get a scholarship to go study in the University of West Indies in Trinidad. You know what? And like she, that story as well as my aunt who got a scholarship to study in Cambridge, I just remember thinking like, well, I can't be the only one in the family that's, that's not doing something and not further in education. So I chose New York because at the time, um, my grandmother uh, had a green card and essentially she filed for us. So it made sense to kind of go to America just because I had the opportunity to have papers and study there. So um, I went to New York as well because they had that school, John Jay College of Criminal Justice that I attended that had the program I wanted to study, forensic science. So really that motivation just came from Why my family. Why did you want to study forensic science? Uh, like, I, I don't see, you know, you know your order, you like my like my living law and order. No, you know, like, it's funny you say that. It's funny you say that. I actually just got interviewed last week um, by a panel of writers for law and order because they're writing about a character, a female, in the detective squad, so they, you know, the chief, one of the chiefs called me and said, "Hey, listen, there's only four females in detective squads. We think you should talk to the writers." So it's funny you say that. Law and order is they usually tend to stick to script, tend to stick to reality. Um, so yeah, it is really kind of like law and order. Obviously, we don't solve cases normally in 24 hours, but we do a good job with that. Um, but I chose forensic science. Why forensic science? Yeah. So I, I had studied science and, you know, in the Caribbean, there's always kind of like some underlying pressure to do science or law or something like that. So I always liked science too. I loved chemistry and physics when I was growing up. So I was already in the science field. I did that in high school in Dominica and I did a year of college in Dominica. So in my head, I couldn't really veer away too much from science, but I also love the aspect of law and how it's applied and um, seeking justice for people that can't seek it for themselves. Cause, you know we can't all be batman so um i was like oh the perfect fusion of science and law is forensic science you're essentially studying how to apply science to um to basically solve a crime that's to me is just perfect so that's why i chose that field and you decided after completing university to do what so okay so funny story so i think most people have this um this struggle when they come from a small island, they don't have a lot of money. There's not a lot of millionaires in the Caribbean that look like us. So when I came to New York, I did not have a lot of money. And I remember my mom, I wanted to go to the military just to save myself from 
financial burdens on my family. So I remember my mom saying, hey, listen, we have enough money for one semester. So do one semester and, um, you know, we'll figure out what happens after. And then I got scholarships on top of scholarships so I could feel. Yeah, it was God was God has been looking out for me from birth, I feel like. Um, so that's why, I'm, you know, I got that also my religion from my family. But um, I feel God has blessed me in that aspect. So um, study. So basically, I. I decided that I was going to come here and study forensic science because that's just something I'm passionate about. Um, and essentially I did it for four years. Um, it was one of the hardest things I ever had to do. It was like 40 hours of science every week. And meanwhile, all my friends in other, in other science, in other um, majors like criminal justice, you know, you go to class and you go home. But in forensic science, you go to class and you still have to go to lab and then you still have to go to recitation and you still have to go home and study. So it was a lot, but um, I don't know if that answered your question. It did, it did. So you decided to join yes. the NYPD. Yes. Why? So I am, I am in school one day and it's a funny story because, I mean, it's sad because the cop who recruited me actually felt ill and he's off the job now. But I remember thinking like, oh, well, like I need to get money because I was working a lot. I was working like jobs like Radio Shack, which was horrible. I don't know if Radio Shack has seen this, but I have no problem saying it. It was a horrible job. Like, you know, you were, you were like, basically like, I felt like, I felt like I wasn't using any of my talents. I was just on the floor trying to sell batteries to make money. And then when I was in school, um, because John Jay used to be a, like a basically at a cop school because it's a criminal justice school. So most cops go there they will always be like recruiting stations. Hey, join the NYPD. But that was never on my mind. Even if people try to say, oh, your dad was a cop, so you got it from your dad. No, like my dad wasn't really in my life like that. So he wasn't really a big influence on the decision. It was really that cop that said to me, I was walking past him and he said, um, he said, hey, 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 listen, you can make, you know, $14 an hour by joining the cadet corps. And all I heard jail is $14 an hour. I said, what, what do I have to do? <laughs> Because at the time I was making seven dollars, seven dollars an hour in New York City is not helpful. Like you, like you're literally having to work two jobs just to pay rent. Because rent in New York City is expensive. Everybody wants to come to New York and live this this lavish lifestyle, but you can't if you don't have money. It just doesn't happen that way. So anyway, so he re he told me that I signed up, and the Cadet Corps essentially is like an internship program that you do for two years. They give you money for school, by the way. So I was like, wait, you're giving me money for school. You pay me fourteen dollars an hour. I can make my own schedule, and I'm part of NYPD. I was like, sign me up. So I signed up, and I did that for three years. And I tell you, I didn't know anything about the NYPD except what I saw on TV. And the cops were so great to me. They would always encourage me. They're like, you know, don't drop out of school. Join the job. Be a, be a police officer. You're gonna do great. You're smart. You'll be a chief one day. They would tell me this as a cadet, like I was just a civilian. And they would drop me to school, pick me up. Like, I just felt like, wow, these people are actually investing in somebody they don't even know because they talk, they, we talk a lot about like um, the blue family and it's like, a, you know, big up to my sister, she made this cup for me. But yes. um, we basically have a blue family. It's just people that were looking out for me that um, just because I was part of the job. So that's really my story of how I became. And then, you know, that's how I was recruited. So that's how I joined the NYPD. And ever since after the cadet corps, um, you make a decision if you want to leave and continue a civilian life or if you want to join and join the academy. And again, I joined the academy. It was six months. And I was like, wait, you paid me to work out and learn the law? Like, I was just like, why do, in my head, I was like, why don't more people do this? Like, <laughs> I, like working out. I, I wouldn't say I was the fittest person, but I used to like going out there and being, going to the gym and working out. So I was like, mm -hmm. pay me six months, a free trainer. And to learn the law, I was like, this is, this, this, there's nothing else you need to tell me. And I had a great time in the academy. Um, I did well academically. Obviously, there were a lot of other people there that was more fit than I was. But um, I did that, graduated, and um, here I am 10 years later, and I love it. Like, I just, I just love it. Now, you are, you are a woman, which we all I, can see. I identify you are, as a woman, yes. <laughs> You are also a black. Yes, woman. yes, uh -huh. and guess what? And guess what, people, people who are listening, she is the only black female in the rank of lieutenant 
among 77 recent detective squad. Yep. How the hell did you get there? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a funny story. I'll try to truncate it. But okay, so I joined a job. I'm a cop in the street. And one thing I will say with NYPD is that if you work out, like any, like I tell people, NYPD is an organization and I haven't really worked for other organizations because I joined the job when I was 22 years old. I was 22 years old on the streets in Brooklyn. I, I didn't even know anything about Brooklyn. I didn't really know much about New York. I was only in New York for five years. Um, and now I'm policing. Um, so essentially I'm on, I'm, I'm doing what every cop does when they join the job. They have street cops. They go, you know, they, they enforce the law. And they, they say what you do is you pay your dues. You know, you're a rookie on the street. You learn the street. And then when you want to, you know, do something else, you can. So NYPD recognizing that I have a forensic science degree, I got a call from the chief of detectives. And they said, hey, listen, we have what we call a crime lab. I know you've seen it in CSI. They have, they have to test all the evidence that come in. So they said, hey, you have a forensic science degree and you're a cop you should work in the crime lab. So I was like, oh, that sounds great. So I did that um, for two years and the crime lab is part of the bureau. So that was my first experience in learning about the detective bureau and what detectives do and how they go about really solving a case. Because all I knew about casework was what I saw on TV. I didn't do casework in the street. The street is just, you see a crime, you react, or you, you're there to make sure a crime doesn't occur um, versus an investigation is, we'll get into that. But um so I did that, and then I always knew I wanted to to get promoted. Like, I always knew I wanted to move up, so I ended up taking the promotional exam to sergeant. I did well. I, again, I was very blessed to do well on the exam. Um, so I was promoted in the first class of sergeants. Um, and then again, when you get promoted, they send you back on patrol. So I went to patrol, loved it, did my time. You know, you have to pay your dues. And then essentially um, the chief of detectives in Brooklyn South called and said, hey, listen, do you want to come for an interview? And I was like, well, I'm not doing much. You know, I'm on patrol. Of course I'd want to do an interview. I interviewed. And I remember thinking, you know, I want to kind of say that out there too. We, a lot of times, a lot of females or even blacks on this job, we kind of, we kind of doubt ourselves because, you know, we kind of underrepresented in the department. Um, just like we're underrepresented in America. It's just going to happen. So we kind of doubt ourselves, like, okay, will they take me? Am I good enough? You know, because I don't have family on the job. There's a lot of police officers whose dad was a cop, whose grandfather. I don't have lineage on the job. So it's just me, you know. It's me trying to navigate this huge department of 30,000 cops, you know. So I started down to myself. I was like, they're not going to take me. I have no, like, gun arrest. I'm not, like, the, the, the cop who usually gets the squad. So in my head, I was like, all right, you know, but there's a, there's a phrase that my mother taught me when she was, when I was younger, a lot, she used to say, you can't be considered if you don't apply. And I always say this in my head, like why? So if the, if they're asking me for an interview, I can, I can hold myself back and say, Oh, I'm not working. Okay. Um, I don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. Hello. Okay, so Renee, we're getting a little bit of feedback, guys. If you, <clears throat> we're getting a little bit of feedback. You were cutting off for just a oh, second. Okay. We lost you when you said your mom said when you were growing up. Your mom said if you used to tell you if you don't, if you cannot be considered if you don't apply. Correct. That we lost you. Right. So take a so so right. So she used to always say, and um, one thing, uh, my mom, my my mom and my aunts and my sister and my cousins they were a big influence in my life, right? So I always, like, in my head when I make a decision, I'm always thinking, okay, what would these people do? Because they've done so much in life already to, to get success. So I always wanted to kind of mirror that. So I was like, you know what? They want to have an interview. I'll go for the interview. What's the worst that can happen? I stay where I'm at. Like, that's the worst that can happen. So I go for the interview. And I remember the chief, Chief Didonato, very old Italian guy, accent, white, you know, and he's in his office. He's like, have a seat, you know. And he's talking to me like he actually wants to interview me. And I'm, I'm really still like, why does this guy want to talk to me? Like, in my head, I haven't done anything to really deserve an interview. Um, like I said, in my head, like, there are other people in the street getting gun arrests, you know, violent arrests that probably would be better in an investigative unit than me. And he said to me, he was like, you might not have the arrest like everyone else, but one thing you do have is you're smart. And that's what it takes to be in the bureau. You have to be able to 
you have a science mind and what a scientist does is they break things down logically just because that's how we see the world. So he's like, if you have those skills, you can be in the detective bureau, you can learn it and you could probably be very successful. So I was like, all right, boss, sign me up. Let's do this. And then, <laughs> and then I became a sergeant and I, I worked in Canarsie at the time. There's a lot of gun violence and a lot of gang violence. So I was working in a very violent area in Brooklyn South. So we were dealing with homicide investigations, um, shootings, and I loved it. And I learned so, let me tell you, New York City detectives, and it's not because I'm biased, because if people don't, if people are not good, I'll tell you, listen, JL, they're not good here. Like, New York City detectives are very good at their job. So one thing I notice is it doesn't matter who the victim is. It doesn't matter if there's somebody with a criminal record. It doesn't matter if there's somebody with who, who is, you know, the mayor's daughter. It doesn't matter if they're black, brown, purple. Their focus is somebody committed a crime against this person. We have to find the person. It's like they're a bunch of little Batman in a, in a, in a, in a, in an office and they're just working every day to like fight. So it's really what we see on Law and Order. Yeah. Big well, right. Well, mine is the social issues, right? Like mine is the, you know, Law and Order has to be dramatic. Um, most of the detectives I work with are super, like all of them are very professional. So it's not like, you know, a law and order stabler had issues and like, <laughs> you know, it's not like that. Like everyone has issues, but the squad generally are professional. Like you don't come to the detective squad as a, a, and become a detective if you're not the person that can handle that sort of lifestyle, that sort of dedication to fighting crime. And that's why I felt it was a complete blessing to work with these people. And that's how I learned a lot as a sergeant and getting to the rank of lieutenant. I took the lieutenant's exam. And um, when I got promoted, like, remember when I told you, um, when you get promoted, they send you back to patrol. So yes, yes. when I got promoted, they retained me. Like they said, you know what? You don't need to be on patrol. We need you to stay in the deta jail. I, that was my, that was my facial expression. When they told me they were retaining me, I was like, me, I keep saying, I was like, I haven't done anything. Like why are you retaining me? And they retained me and I got promoted to Lieutenant and they sent me to Manhattan South. And now I'm in the Bronx because you know what they said to me? They said, you did well in Manhattan South, which Manhattan South, um, let me kind of explain that. So Manhattan South has less violence. They have more property crime because, you know, the, like your economic status in Manhattan usually matches rich people. So the yes. violence is not as, you know, rampant or at all. So I dealt with a couple shootings here or there, but nothing like the Bronx. So they said, you know what? You did well in Manhattan South. You have two years as a lieutenant in the bureau. We're going to send you to the four, six squad. We're going to send you to the to to the violent squad in the Bronx because we think that you can handle it. And I've been there now over eight, nine weeks, and I've just been constantly impressed by my detectives every day. Constantly impressed how they link things together, how they find these like and when I tell you like they work nonstop and we have a good time, but it's almost they make my job easy. I know they're watching so <laughs> <laughs> but, like big up to the four six squad because they essentially are so professional and like i said no matter what is happening sometimes these people they will sleep in the squad like i've slept in the squad they will stay there they, and they have families they have daughters they have kids they have wives um and they will they will sacrifice sometimes family time just to pursue justice and to find these criminals so that's really how i i became a lieutenant and so i don't have lieutenant experience on patrol I just have lieutenant experience in the bureau, and apparently that's all I needed. Um, and the job has been good to me, so it's I'm been. Gonna ask, I'm going to ask you a difficult question. Yes. Have you ever used your firearm? So <laughs> don't. I don't know why you why you felt you needed to have taco tea in your mouth. <laughs> your question. So that's a very common question I get from civilians. So if you look at the numbers, not just me. Generally, police officers will probably never fire their weapon in their entire 20 years career. So using your weapon is different. So you, based on the law, like I can take my firearm out if I believe at that time I may need to use deadly physical force. That's what the firearm is, deadly physical force. So cops are usually sometimes in situations where they may feel like they have to use deadly physical force. So have I... So I remember once I've, I've taken my firearm out in situations where I felt like I needed to because I've been shot at when I worked in Brooklyn. Like, let me tell you something. People will see a uniform absent a person. 
So they'll just see a uniform and in their head, that's the enemy. And I know I'm, it's, this is not like Iraq or Afghanistan, but in their head that you're the enemy. So we've been shot. When I was on impact, we were shot at. Um, so at that point, you, you take your weapon out. You're not pointing at anyone, but you know you're going to engage a shooter. You don't want to be late to the draw. Um, so I've done that. Gunpoint robberies. I've showed up. Luckily, I tell you, like God has been looking out for me. I haven't had to fire on someone. But I've had situations where I had to take my weapon out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How did you feel getting shot at? You know what's funny? You know what's funny? I always say, like, police officers are special people. You know, it takes a special person to exit yourself. Like, when I go to work, I'm not Renee. Like, I'm Lieutenant Francis. So, like, when you're on the street, you have to remember you're there for a reason. And if you allow fear to take over your body, then you get hurt. So I was always taught in the academy that when you go to the street, always remember it's your safety first and then everyone else. So at the time when this is happening, when I'm, I actually also got shot with my shot out with my sergeant in a car, and I just remember looking at her, and she it was just like an instant response. Instant response was, all right, where, where's the shoot at? You're not even thinking, wait a second. Let me run. <laughs> We shouldn't be here. Like, this is not normal. Normal day life is I'm not engaging someone with a fire or much less someone who's shooting at us. But you're so concerned of this person is really thinking that they can be in New York City and shooting people. Because I always say, like, I was taught bullets do not have eyes. So, you're, as a cop, most cops go into dangerous situations because the person that they're prioritizing is are the civilians. So... They don't want someone with a firearm on the street. They want to stop that person and get the gun and, again, seek justice, you know. So at the time, at the time, I wasn't afraid. I was just like, where is this Where is this person? Like, we need to get this person. This is crazy. It's like 3 o'clock in the afternoon and you're busting a gun at people. Like, no, you need to get arrested. Like, something's wrong with you. But I'm not thinking I'm going to get shot because sometimes I think cops are like Batman. They're like, no, Batman doesn't go out thinking... Oh, yeah, I'm going to die today. Like, Batman doesn't think that. You know what Batman thinks? I'm a superhero. I'm going to save the world. So I think cops, when they go out to work, when, when, when they have to activate and, and engage someone, because I see it a lot. I work with, even in Manhattan, there are some Manhattan cops who are sergeants who didn't start in Manhattan. They worked in violent commands. And I was just talking to a friend of mine who's a sergeant in Manhattan, and he made a gun arrest. And I'm talking to him, and I'm like, he tells me they see a guy with a gun, the guy pulls the gun out and they're, and he's chasing the guy with the gun. And the first thing I'm thinking for him is, wait a second, you didn't shoot that guy? Like, like you weren't afraid that he was going to shoot you. He took a firearm out. It was loaded jail with bullets. And you know what he says? He was like, no, I tackled him and I took the firearm. And the guy's like, he, it was just another day for him because he's gotten so many guns. Then Omar El Sayed in the ninth, he's just like, but he's, he's just a person that, like every other person I've met on the job, just like in my squad, they go to do a video canvas, right? So we go try to get video so we can solve crime. And I'm talking to them. I was like, you guys made a gun arrest when you went to get video surveillance on someone? He's like, yeah, we saw him. He had a gun. So we tackled him. We took the firearm. Like, it's just like, like in their head, it's just like normal. And I'm sitting there like, this is not normal. Like, normal people are not nonchalant about taking loaded firearms off of criminals. But I tell you, Jill, like I told you, man, there's a lot of impressive people on this job. But yeah, um, did that answer your question? I, I, I'm glad that you spoke about about the good stuff because lately there's a lot of the bad stuff uh, where it relates to the the, the blue lives or the, yes. the blue family or, or police officers. There's been a lot um, going around that, and and we cannot not speak on it. This is not about them. This interviews about you but because you are so heavily involved with, with this and it, it technically affects you all of what is going on in the world not just as a police officer but as a black police officer how do you feel about what's going on and i, I want to keep the, the question very broad and very open to give you an opportunity to say what you want to say and what you need to say and not necessarily zoning on any specific questions um because this again is not about them this interview is about you huh man how do i feel about what's going on <laughs> we could be here for hours so i'm not gonna pontificate on these topics too long but um i will say 
you know, I've been on job 10 years and I've seen many videos posted, right? Um, I think we are living, we live in a culture where um, we enjoy, I wouldn't say enjoy, but things that are viral are things that, you know, that captivate us and, and most of it is generally not good, right? So we see a lot of negativity on the news a lot and we see a lot of, so, I, and I'll say this, I, I, I don't know any cop, white, black, Hispanic, Asian, who enjoys seeing videos where cops take it too far. I don't know any cop. I don't surround myself with cops that are, that are corrupt either. I don't even know them. Like, you know, they say birds of a feather flock together. I've worked with cops that, are, that essentially, like I said, are kind of, kind of like colorblind. So it's like, you're a criminal, I'm going to treat you accordingly. It's not, you're a black criminal, I'm going to treat you accordingly. So when I see these videos, it, it, it doesn't please me. Especially like, I'll give you an example of George Floyd, right? That was horrible to watch. I generally don't like watching those videos, but I had to because of the, you know, what, what it caused the riots and the protests. I had to see it for myself and I was disgusted. I was honestly disgusted. And my first thought was, how could this happen? Like, how could this happen? Because jail, I haven't seen it. And I'm not saying this to protect the NYPD. I love the NYPD, but I haven't seen behavior like this. And if I was there, I would have been the first person to engage that cop and probably end up fighting him because at the end of the day, we don't treat people like that. You know, I, like I said to you, man, I work with, I work with people that get really bad guys off the street, shooters, people who kill people for a living, homicide people. Like you understand the violence that I witnessed in the Bronx, violence, like shooting people in the face, in the head, just things that normal people shouldn't see every day. And I see how detectives and cops treat them. They treat them like a person who did something that will get their day in court. I have not witnessed this atrocity like George Floyd. So when I saw that, I was like, this is, this, this is just disgusting. So, you know, how I feel about it, especially being black myself, I obviously have to look at that and sometimes think, all right, Renee's going to think about this. And Renee obviously is a black person. And, you know, you, you feel attacked because you are the minority and the videos that are being shown are of minorities. Um, so it, it, the climate right now, you know, I understand people's frustration. Like I said, I'm Renee still. Like right now you're talking to Renee, not necessarily just Lieutenant Francis. So, um, you know, everyone that I know, white, white officers, black officers, Hispanics are disgusted. They're like, you know, but at the end of the day, they're also disgusted because they know we now have to take on the pains of these bad officers. We now have to take blame for it. So when people see us, they just see Chauvin, that cop who, because at the end of the day, it's hard for them to, to compartmentalize and say, no, it's just one bad person. You know, there are a lot of, what I want to tell people is there are a lot of bad people in every profession. And the NYPD has 32,000 cops, maybe more. 32,000 cops NYPD has. And, you know, when you look back at the, obviously policing never had a great history in America. I wasn't there for that, but I understand the history so I can understand people's anger and fear. And maybe their own personal experience wasn't great. So now they've now, attach that experience to every cop they see you know so mm -hmm. obviously like i said i don't know any cop that's happy right now i don't know any cop that's feeling great about policing people you know right now cops are feeling like oh my goodness like is someone gonna hurt me just because of what chauvin did because i didn't put hands on you and you know I, it's difficult right now it's when i work the protests people are yelling at me calling me an uncle tom or um, they like to use this phrase um a sellout how can you do this to your own people? I'm like, do this to my own people. Like I'm out here trying to save people. Like I'm out here trying to get criminals off the street. I'm not shopping. I'm not putting you in a chokehold. I'm not putting my, like, we, I'm not doing that. So right now the climate is, is very hot and I know people are upset. I mean, who wouldn't be upset watching that video? I just would like people to understand that there are a lot of cops who are disgusted by this. And they're a lot like, you know, the latest video that we saw where someone was put in a choco, you could see the cops saying, yo, get off. Cops were doing this a long time before Chauvin. The cops in Chauvin's case didn't do it. I can't speak on them. Obviously, they have a malfunction that we need to take care of. But like I said, I've seen cops do the right thing multiple times. And of course, there's going to be a little bias because I am on the job, but I don't close my eyes to corruption i'm the last person that's doing that if i see somebody doing something and now i'm a lieutenant so i'm mandated i can't even decide i'm not gonna do it because i'm not losing my job for these people 
You know, people like to talk about, oh, there's a blue wall of silence. Now, I, there ain't no blue wall of silence with me. Like, I'm not losing my job for a corrupt cop who shouldn't be on this job. Like, absolutely not. You need to, like, some people don't need to be on this job, just like some people don't need to be in a lot of professions because they're not professionals. So, period. 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 We get it, guys. That was the time if you have any questions to ask your questions because we're getting down to the end of this interview and the end of season three finale. Francis, I just want to ask this. Um, oops, I, I feel like I feedback here. Just give me a second. Okay, so I just want to ask, do you get have any challenges at all? Because you seem to be super... Miss Positive, Miss Get the Job Done, on to the next. Do you have challenges, girl? Man, I, I, I do. I mean, it's hard because I think I have a lot of challenges due to my own personal, um, you know, how I look at myself. You know, and I tell that to my, and the great thing about detectives, because I work with it. So this is what I'm, I'm going to speak on what I know. I work with detectives. So I'm not going to talk about patrol because I'm not on patrol. But, like, I work with people that, like I said, they're very professional, so they, need, they deserve to be where they are. So I can talk with them openly without being judged. So, you know, I tell them all the time, like, if I, if, I re if, if I ask someone to do something, I'm very big on team concept. So that's because of what I saw in the job. There are a lot of people who, I'm not sure what happened when they were raised, but I was raised a certain way. You treat people with respect no matter who it is. Um, and as a supervisor, to try to, to, to maintain... Um, success in your squad people have to be happy I feel like happy workers are effective workers and for people to be happy you have to treat them with respect but at minimum people don't expect you to be you know to expect favoritism they just expect to be respected and you respect someone by how you speak to them and how you treat them and sometimes just in my own in the back of my head um, I think maybe if they didn't do something that I asked them maybe it's because I'm a female I'm young or I was never a detective so I have my own, like, um, how should I say it? My own fears of, of, of my, my, my lack of experience that I think holds me back. But um, I'm working on that. You know, I, you know like, they, 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 the detectives always make me feel welcome, you know. And they, they say things like, they don't even notice, but when they say things like, oh, we don't want you to leave, that, that makes me feel like, oh, wow, like, whoa, like, I'm doing a good job. Like, they respect me. It's hard to gain respect from people if you are, if you don't understand how you want to be respected as well. Um, but I do have challenges. I would say, like I said, you know, I'm still new. I'm learning every day. And I think to be successful on this job, you have to be able to learn from people who've done it or who keep doing it, and they will make you successful. You know, you all, I'm always learning and I'm always eager to, to have a conversation with my team. I call them my team. I'm not, oh, I'm a lieutenant. Do what I say. Screw you. No, this is a team. Let's discuss this case. Let's see how we can all put our minds together to get an arrest. So my challenge is that just my own, you know, personal challenge. But as far as the job challenge wise, I was, you know, I, you know, people, I never experienced things that maybe other people experience in terms of racism, in terms of my race holding me back. I think on the contrary, I think the job has been like, whoa, we, this is great. We now have a black female in a detective squad that in, as a lieutenant, because right now they don't. We only have four female lieutenants in the entire, every precinct has a detective squad and there's 77 detective squads and there's only four females. And I'm one of four. So when I go to these meetings, I'm like, we're on the <laughs> we're on females. We're on you guys. You know, and and then on top of that, um, I'm black. We're black people. <laughs> and then you see know, the one black person, like it will usually be a male sergeant, and you're like, you're you know, you're like you're a head nod, like I see you, bro. We in the struggle, you know, it's like so that's a struggle because you know, you don't see people that look like you in a job that, you know, that you would take, you know, humans are animals and animals hang out with people that look like them. So it's like you naturally get comfortable. That's why a lot of my friends here are West Indian people because I'm West Indian. Like, so it's like I'm looking at these meetings for people like me so I can at least have some sort of like cultural connection just based on race. Not saying that I work well with all races, but that's 
that's one of the challenges, you know. I don't, I can't. Certain ways I have to speak a certain way because, especially my accent. I don't know how my accent sounded now. I'm sure somebody's gonna say, "Oh, you was yanking," but it's like I've been here so long and I have to speak a certain way because people won't understand me. Because again, I'm looking in the room. Where the West Indians at? Oh, okay, y'all not here either. So it's like that's a difficulty. Race, my immigrant status, my gender, and my age. Where the young people at? Like, you know, I'm always, it's just like I can't, you know. But um. Again, where I actually work, my detectives always, you know, I've never felt uncomfortable with my detectives. And I, I feel like the job is really trying to, if you were, now mind you, you don't get ahead just because you're black or female on this job. No, nope, that's not correct. However, if you're competent and you show up and you show them, because that's why I work so hard, because I don't want to be, if someone had a bias in their head, I don't want to confirm that bias. I want to eliminate it. I want them to be like, yo, these black females out here doing their thing. I don't want to be the black female that's like, yeah, I go home on time. Like I, I was out, I was, I'm usually off weekends, which is a privilege, right? For you lieutenants in the squad. But like in my head, my detectives know I'm never off. So like, because I'm in Brooklyn, no, I'm sorry, in the Bronx, they call me whenever, they, I was like, call me whenever you have a shooting. They're like, that's going to be a lot of phone calls. So like, I'll be sleeping and they were like, call me. And I'm like, let me guess, someone shot. But I'm, I'm up, like, I want to know what's going on. Like, I'm never disconnected from my job because I need to be successful so that more people like me can see it can be done and that we can start, you know what I'm saying? You know, yes. you know, like, that's we got questions. They're coming in full force. Oh, my God, I need to, like, I need to, people are asking things so fast and so furious. Oh There's a John Rod asking um, can you ask the lieutenant? Can, can you ask the lieutenant a question? Ask her about the Solomon episode. Solomon episode? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what they mean by that. Moving along, because you don't know about that. What is your advice to little black boys and girls hoping to be police officers in Dominica? Oh, anywhere. Dominica. So it's funny. Um, a lot of you know. I guess it's it's out now that I'm in the NYPD. <laughs> Because it's not like necessary something like I really like publish out there. I do, I have Instagram, so I do like, um, sometimes I'll post when I'm having a good time with my detectives. Like the other day, we went to the Joker Stairs in the Bronx. I saw that. Yeah. I was so you know, it was just such a long week because I was preparing for this huge meeting where, you know, there's a panel of like chiefs and you, you don't want to let them, because remember I was retained, right? So I don't want them to think they made a mistake. So like I said, I'm always thinking like success, success, success. And I was so stressed out, and this team, um, you know, uh, of detectives, um, Jay Mena, Awani, and them, we decided, they knew the area because they've been working there a lot, very good detectives, and they said, um, hey, you still want to go to the Joker Stairs and, like, kind of, like, just free up and, like, you loosen up and stuff like that? I was like, yeah, let's go, and they took me there, and they were just so supportive, and they just made me feel like, even if I'm a little crazy, they made me feel normal, and they were taking pictures of me, and I was just like, Every time I look at where I'm at, I'm, all, I'm just like, I'm completely blessed to be working with people like that, that, that embrace me. Um, so going to Dominica, I, I don't know a lot of police officers in Dominica. I do know they face a lot of challenges by not having the funds that they need to, to do policing in a certain way. It's, it still blows my mind when I see women police officers in Dominica wearing skirts, you know, and, and they're unarmed. I, because I, I, but however, Dominica, I guess the crime level is not like the level of crime in New York City. So maybe it doesn't call for that. But, you know, the advice I'll give little boys, I guess, in Dominica is just focus on your studies because I think that my competence comes through my education and my experience of traveling and seeing how, how, how the world is different, but mainly just keeping my mind solid and understanding how the world works. And always studying and reading articles. You don't have to be a nerd. I'm a nerd, I would think. I read a lot. I think if you keep your mind sharp, you will always be successful. So I would say for little kids in Dominica, just keep reading. Just keep staying in school, first of all. Stay in school. Um, and you make your mind sharp and you'll be a sharp detective one day. Maybe you're a sharp police commissioner or a lieutenant. You know, I, I'm here because you have to pass two exams to get here. Not everybody's going to be a lieutenant on this job. Or a sergeant, you have to study that. The patrol guy is this thick, and you have to know every single thing in that guide. And you know, even people who are not bosses, they're like, "I'm not studying that book because it's 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 a lot of work." 
you don't just become a lieutenant. Like I didn't just, I wasn't just dropped here. I had to work for it. I, I was studying all the time. But that's one thing I'm good at, Jail. Like, you know, I'm, you, Dominica, you can't go home with like a 98 on this test. My grandmother would be like, well, why you ain't get home? I have 32 marks. You know, like I got, a, I got a 99 on my lieutenant's exam. And I never forgot. My grandmother was like, <laughs> my grandma was like, oh, you did good. You did good. Didn't get 100, right? <laughs> I was like, I didn't need 100. I'm like number three on the list. But like, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just so thankful for that because I always tell people your parental units and your family make you who you are. And when people say, oh, you know, people, people who are in low income housing, they're lazy and they should just, they should just stop selling crack and just go work a job. And I'm like, yo, these people don't have a proper parental unit. Their mom is on crack and their father isn't around. That affects who you are, you know? And when my mom died, that affected me. Because I'm like, wow, now I'm on a ship with no compass. Now I'm just sailing because my mom kept me on that road to success. My mom, my aunts, and my aunts took over full time now. You know, I'm grown. I'm 32. I don't really need a parent, but my aunts keep me in check. My sister, my sister keeps me in check. My cousins, both on the seaman side and, and on, and on the Francis side, Leanne, all these people keep me in check. They're like, keep going because it's hard. It's hard to keep motivating yourself because you get knocked down a lot. The public don't want cops right now. The public don't want to see you. You know, I don't really get a lot of shout outs like, yo, thanks for your service. That's why I have this mug because I'm proud to be black, but I'm also proud to be a cop. Cause even if you don't really thank me, I'm not doing it for thanks. But at the end of the day, when you keep getting knocked down and you go to protests and people, like I worked the protest, they were sending, they were sending glass bottles at us. And it was just insane. I was like, we did not do this. I understand the frustration. But like I said, it, you, it, it takes motivation. And, and, and like I said, when my mom passed, it was difficult for me to keep, you know, that straight line, you know, that, that lady kept me like in check. Like she was like, Oh, you're doing your thing. Make sure you study, you know, make sure you do keep your job. And so like, you know, little boys in Dominica, just keep your mind sharp and you're going to be successful. Thank you very much for that. I will take one more question. I know. <laughs> one more. I know people have so many questions, Jail. Questions. Look at you. So you told me, Ali. You too to talk. <laughs> um, you hey. also teach. Um, so oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You also I forgot about that. <laughs> you also teach. So so just putting it out there to let people know that you're 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 also educating people. And Renee, one of the things I I must tell you, you need to look into it. You need to look into um motivation motivational speaking and speaking. Hey. Yeah. You like oh, I'm a You like to talk. That is that. It's 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 your talent you have, and you're also very sharp. You're very educated, and I feel like you can you can definitely move young people in the because what you say, I know it hitting home for every like every other person. It hits home. So if there's fifty people on this live, at least twenty five of them are like, okay, that's for me. Okay, that's for me. Okay, that's for me. You know? Like you 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 speak. You have a lot of. You, you have a lot of values and a lot of that has to, has to come of course from your upbringing and you, you the way you speak and the way you explain it how you express yourself top you should you should definitely besides being a, a teacher and i know you you uh you're a professor at um you do you teach at, at your alma mater mm -hmm. definitely look into motivational speaking and that's something i'm telling you girl i'm putting that out there for you you can take it or you can let it alone i'm usually very very good at those things and when i tell people to do things and they listen they always that might just be your thing what's next for you well let me let, let me you brought up teaching so i don't i wouldn't even say that i was trying to do everything my mother did but i feel like she was such a big influence in my life because my mom used to teach she used to teach at civil course she used to teach at the Dominica State College. Um, um, she used to teach at Rosa Boys School. Like I just always remember this lady passing on some sort of education to people. You know, my aunts also. You know, they don't necessarily teach in a teaching capacity, but what they do, their job is to teach people how to do certain things. So in my head, I'm like, you know what? I I was I started off teaching again. Like I said, hard work makes a dream work. So I was at John Jay. As a student, and I was, we were work. He was studying me. All, 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 we had like a little West Indian club, St. Lucian, Trinidadians, um, you know, and my cousin too. I met my, I met Tiffany, my cousin, like Dominica cousin at school. She stopped me in the stairs and she was like, 
yo, yo, my cousin. And I was like, what? You know how dumb it is. Everybody's cousin. Like, what are you doing there? Yeah, I was like, I don't know you. You're a psychopath. And she was like, no, girl, I, I your cousin from Dominica. And I'm like, okay. And then from that, we still, we obviously were still close. But going back to John Jay, like, um, we were, we were studying so hard because of our background. And they were like, oh, you want to teach? And I was like, all I heard was, all I heard was cha-ching. Right. <laughs> oh, I my rent. My money. I to pay my rent now? I said, sure. And that's how I started teaching. And I always say now, I will do it now. Even because my job, NYPD, um, they pay the they pay well is my point. So you don't have to work another job. You work another job if you want to, you know, invest and kind of like just grow yourself and whatever you have going on. So I don't have to get paid from John Jay. But what I love about it is a lot of civilians have this idea of what a cop is. And I like to break that stereotype. So I'm like, if I teach civilians, they'll see, like when I go, I always do this experiment. I go to the class, every semester I go to the class early and I sit in the class like a student and nobody ever thinks I'm the professor. So I wait like five minutes and I'm always like, where's this teacher at? She wasted my time. And then the students will be like, yeah, where is she? She's late. And then I get up and I go in front of the class. I'm like, oh, I'm here. And they're like, oh my gosh, like, what do you, like, they just don't believe somebody like me would be their professor. And then I, I like teaching because like I said, I can pass on whatever knowledge I have. I don't teach them NYPD's policies, but I teach women in policing. Who better? I'm a woman in policing. I teach policy analysis, which I think if you have great policy, you have a great society. So if we can understand how to create policy, good policy, then we will we'll be in good shape. That's why you hear a lot of people because of what happened with Chauvin and, and George Floyd and multiple other people who died at the hands of police brutality. You hear them always saying, we got to change policy because the policy is the reason why we see, you know, the lack of convictions with these officers. So you have good policy, you have good policing, you have good policy, you have a good society in general. So I, I love teaching and um, what's next for me? Wow. You know, I used to be that person. Oh, uh, what's my five year plan? You know, where I see myself in five years and it's worked out because it's helped me keep stay on my path. But when my mother passed away, my mother died at 51. I never thought that would happen because I'm like 51. I was 26 when my mom died. And I used, I, cause my grandmother, my grandmother is a rocker. That lady is like, that lady is 90, never had a, had a problem. No blood pressure issue. This lady has been, I feel like she, um, she might outlive me. Who knows? But I was, I was expecting my mom to at least be 80, you know, in my own selfish way. I was thinking like, Oh, I got some more time with her. So when she passed at, at 51, I was like, oh, wow, I might not have that much time left. So let me just make sure I'm enjoying what I do and I'm, I'm surrounding myself with people I like being around. So where I see myself, you know, what do I see for myself? Definitely still moving up in the department because you can't, you can't do change in the department if you, you when I mean change, everyone has a job on this, uh, in the NYPD and if they're good at it, it will, it will continue to keep the NYPD successful. So everybody has a role. So detectives have their role. Um, to play just like I do, but if you want to change policy, you have to be in a rank where people want to hear you. So right now, people listen. Right now, I could call my chief, which I, you can't do as a regular sergeant or a PO. You can't just go in the chief's office. There's like rank. There's like three ranks before chief, so you can't just. But because I'm in the detective bureau, they give you this level of respect where you can call a chief direct. So now they can listen to me, and now I have their ear, and now they actually chiefs call me direct. The chief of detectives called me direct. Hey, Renee, what's going on with this case? And I was like, hey, boss, how's your day? Like, I don't even know how to pick up. <laughs> like, I was just like, the chief of detectives is calling me? What's next? The police commissioner? Like, what's going on here? This is weird. So I feel like if I am in a position where I have a star, like every chief has stars, right? So I was like, if I have a star on my, um, on my uniform one day, then I can have a say in the policy that NYPD puts into place. And there's some things we're not perfect. Like who's perfect? I'm not perfect, but I feel like there's always room for growth. So maybe I can help them grow and put some policies in place that I like because, Hey, I teach policy analysis and maybe I know something, but yeah, that's why I see myself. Maybe, you know, you look me up in 10 years, maybe I'm a chief one day. And if not, you know, I'm blessed regardless if I'm a chief or not, you know, I, I'm going to there. We're putting that app out into the universe. Um, yes. If you're listening, hey, police commissioner, if you're listening, you know, I'd love to be a chief one day, but uh, I would just love doing that because it would, it would also help me be in a position to help others. 
right now I like helping others, but you know, the lower ranks is, is hard. You help civilians, but I mean, I would like to help young officers come up on this job. I always tell people, take the exam. Yeah, let me yeah, ask you a question. I remember, I remember when we, when I did your makeup, um, a couple years ago, I remember I was doing your makeup, I was doing your eye makeup and you're telling the one of the officers you should take the exam you should take the exam. like your your vacation but you're there you are telling me you take the exam like what are you doing like take the exam like you can do it you're smart and whatever and and that's one thing i mean you were not even you, i think you had you were taking the exam for the sergeant or was it i can't remember what exam oh, you taking. no i was a sergeant so I was taking a little exam. yeah yeah and i had you know i brought the book to dominica so it's carnival time and even my my cop at the time the one i brought down he was like why are you studying this is you on vacation i'm like i'm never on vacation like in my head i'm like i have to i have to ace this exam because my grandmother gonna be like oh you couldn't pass okay <laughs> <laughs> Renee, like, like, we could speak we could be happy birthday we could have another episode we should have an extended episode we should have an episode to that, that episode but i i am so happy that i got to end my season three <laughs> you i mean it could have somebody saying um they seen plenty of seamans in the chat big up to the seamans who have tuned big in to, big up to my family oh i have jail you know i i have to give my shout outs like i have to i have to first of all i have to shout out my family who raised me my aunts my sister my cousins obviously my mom my grandma i have to big up you know my friends my west indian friends in america all mostly dominicans I too many too numerous mentions. I'll mention some, you know, they have PhDs. <laughs> <laughs> too numerous to mention, you know, like <laughs> <in the> <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But these people, these people, what again, you see how my mother and my my family keep me in check, my friends keep me in check because like I'll give you any that's asked the question about the young boys. This man has so many degrees I stopped counting. So like my one of my best friends, Roxanne, and another best friend, my second, they both have PhDs. Like these like I'm surrounded by people that just keep motivating me you know and my friend brad that started today he tell me boy i have to go finish the man is going back to get a master's degree like everybody's just around me is better in themselves you know what i mean i see my sister have two kids she she's she works two jobs plus she's trying to you know do a small business like i'm just surrounded by people that's always constantly motivating me even if they don't even say it to me just being around them so i have to pick them up my friends my family i have to pick up my nypd family Without them, who am I? Like, without great detectives, a, a lieutenant is nothing. These people make me shine. They're the ones solving the cases. So when I call, literally, literally my job is, hey, can you tell me about this case? Like, <laughs> that's my job. Like, can you tell me? Like, my job is to just make sure they do their job, but they're so excellent. Sometimes I don't even feel like I'm at work. I just come to work like here and we hang out. But they solve jail. They take the most dangerous people off the street and get a conviction. And every time they do, I do like a dance and they make fun of me because to them it's just their job, but it's not. It's just so big up to the NYPD family and, you know, big up to everybody that's watching. You know, I really appreciate you guys supporting JL's podcast. Everybody who's on there, every single one of you shared this live. <laughs> yeah, share it. So, like, it is so easy to hit share. All of all you liking, all of all you talking, all of all you Also, to have to big up Kenyan, I'm basically in his, like, place. I was like, because he's, my house is not too quiet. So, I was like, oh, let me come over. So, big up to Kenyan. That's one of my friends, retired lieutenant who's in law school. This one, I'm telling you, JL, I surround myself with people that just constantly about it. Just, like, all my family, even on the seaman side, always in school, always doing good. Like, you surround yourself with positivity, you're going to have positive results. That's how I feel. Period. Period. <laughs> Period. <laughs> Full stop. <laughs> like, like you said, at home. Full stop. Right? <laughs> Pleasure having you on here with me. I know when I when I contacted you, like, me? I just want to like, 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 no one was there for me. I'm nobody. Like, I'm like, yeah, we want you. <laughs> we want you on the show. And and I I am so happy that I I, I took the leap of faith in asking you. I mean, we 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 communicate. Every now and again, and and, and and like each other's pictures and each other's posts. <laughs> but you know, it's so it's so good to hear you share your story. Um, you are indeed, you know, an amazing woman, amazing black woman doing your thing, and <laughs> all of us are proud of you. Dominica is proud of you. You know, everybody's proud of you. Well, go visit Dominica. <laughs> 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 she, 
you want to work for this come on Dominic Authority, man. Yeah, I love Dominic. Listen, I every have... time you come home, you have to bring somebody with you. I have... Don't... Yeah, I listen, my friend Crystal, she watching this. Crystal is a solution, a solution American. Crystal go and dunk her more than me. Crystal more Dominican more than me, and I tell her sell her solution flag. So, <laughs> you know, people there's no way you can go to Dominica and not love it because people embrace you. They embrace you like they don't they don't even know people don't know Crystal and people asking me, Hey, where your friend? Like, you know, we're like they, they don't even know but they're asking me, How's your friend doing that? I'm like, She good <laughs> you know like <laughs> about people so that that island i would i would encourage anybody that's not dominican even dominicans go home relax free up you know drink some cacao tea mm -hmm. yes exactly drink some cacao tea aka chocolate right yes <laughs> so. thanks for the opportunity i truly appreciate thanks for having me man i i was blessed man i was like me not me i don't i don't do anything special but I am blessed and I'm, I thank that you, you know, you asked me to come on the show. This is a privilege for me just, to, you know, being able to talk to people and given my side, I didn't think people would even want to care about what I have. Ooh, I might for you to care what I have to say, but I'm glad people, you know, tune in and share the live and keep doing your thing, JL. And anybody has any questions? I'm sure, I guess, I don't know how you can reach me. What? What? I always tell people. My <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I want to tell you. After the show, if you have some time, you can always go back on the live and you can see if anybody has any questions. Oh, right. to okay. wanna, and so you can always, but I always encourage people to go back on there and and, and okay. comment. Okay. I, I really go on there. Later. People saying do the dance. Oh, the dance I do when they solve a solve Well, yeah. let me tell them right now, detectives, if you're watching this, I hope you're working and I hope you find you know. You find my students. And then I'll do the dance. I'll do the dance. <laughs> I work jail. I wish I wish more people had the opportunity to see the great world these people. And again, I know people are gonna say, Oh, you bias, you're a cop, of course you love cops, but you have to understand there's so much great work going on in the background. Just phenomenal cops who like cops who would drop everything to to just take take dangerous people off the street safely, you know, because they believe in the justice system. It's just impressed every time i go to work i'm impressed i don't tell them that you know what i'm saying sometimes you gotta give them tough love like dominican love you can't compliment people every day but they know they know I, i'm completely floored by their work just floor every day four six squad i used to work in six nine squad nine squad ten squad just four six is violent and those guys know what they do and that's why they're there at jail and that's why you know i'm proud to be there so big up everyone i can keep talking so i'm gonna let you finish because I can <laughs> To Thomas Pally. Mm -hmm. Thanks, friends, for coming out and hanging out with us. I truly appreciate it. I hope everyone on the live shared the live. But don't move because we're not exactly done. Renee is saying goodbye, but we're not completely, completely done. We're going out with a bang. Season three finale. Thank you again. Renee. Yes. Bye. Bye. <laughs> yes, guys. Oh my gosh. Amazing individual. Amazing woman. And I'm so proud because she's my family. Hey, <laughs> I almost want to do the, the, hey, hello. It was, it, it was fun. Thank you guys. Thank you very much for staying tuned and for sharing. Well, I hope you guys shared the live a million and one time. 